We're going to continue our discussion of gender by looking at the way gender is related to sexuality. Now, the larger question that we're asking is what is gender and what is the work that gender does? And the question that you want to ask yourself is to what extent are definitions of gender used to oppress women? So gender is important because it's a tool in the oppression of women, right? That's why it's important to feminists, right? We talk about gender because it's a tool used to oppress women. So that's what I want you to be thinking about when you're thinking about gender. So when we left off last time, we were talking about the way in which gender is sexualized. Okay? So right? female behavior is sexualized, right? And then female behavior also has sexual consequences. Right. So what do I mean by that? Right. Um, women actually are highly sexualized in our society. So there's a way in which everything that a woman does is viewed in terms of her sexuality. Right. How she wears her clothes. If she wears tight clothes, then she is you know, seen as a sexual object. Right. Um, how she walks, if she wears high, high heels, if she, you know, talks a certain way, her different, you know, behaviors are sexualized, regardless of whether or not she's thinking about sex or interested in sex or trying to attract sexual, sexual attraction from a particular gender. Um, there's a way in which female behavior is, is always sexualized. And so I want you to pay attention to that when you look at popular media, when you look at movies and television shows and the books. Um, look, look at the extent to which female behavior is always kind of perceived and portrayed in sexual terms. Right? There are also sexual consequences for female behavior in a way that there, there is not for most men. So that if a woman does not conform to societal definitions of gender, she's at a higher risk for sexual consequences like rape or sexual harassment. So in the workplace, if a woman is not behaving in a way that's considered appropriate for her gender, passive enough or, um, you know, feminine enough, then she'll be at greater risk for sexual harassment, right? Or if, she is, or if she is doing exactly what society tells her to do, wear makeup, do up her hair, wear dresses and high heels, there will still be sexual consequences. So then, she, then there will be men who will sexually harass her and say, oh, well, you know, it's because she was wearing these cute clothes and she was so attractive I couldn't help myself. And so, you know, women are kind of in this bind where if they don't conform to societal definitions of femininity, there may be sexual consequences, like lesbians or women who dress in more androgynous clothing are at higher risk of being raped by strangers who are angry that they are dressing this way, dressing like a man, right? So you have a lot of violence against androgynous or genderqueer women because they don't conform to societal definitions. You also have a lot of violence against women who engage in uh, vocations which are traditionally male dominated. So women in the army uh, suffer from much higher rates of rape than women in, say, a feminine profession like teaching. Um, women who work in the trades, I would say a woman in any kind of male dominated field like, you know, plumbing or construction work also is at higher risk for being raped or sexually harassed because here she is working in a male field, traditionally male field, going against societal definitions of women's work. Right? So there are sexual consequences for female behavior, whether you conform to societal definitions of femininity or you don't. Right? And so there are sexual consequences in sexualizing of your gender. Right? So there's this way in which gender and sexual sexuality are always intertwined for women, um, whether they want them to be or not. Okay. Femininity and sexual attraction. So women, um, we, are, we are defined as women in terms of our appearance, in terms of our femininity, and the extent to which we satisfy social definitions of femininity is the extent to which then males will be attracted to us. And so you find women who will uh, wear makeup, you know, spend hours doing their hair, spend a lot of money on clothing if they don't have money for clothing, 
go through painful procedures like, you know, electrolysis or waxing or whatever in order to become hairless. They'll engage in all kinds of rituals of becoming feminine, right? Femininity rituals because they want to attract men. So if you're a heterosexual and you want men to be attracted to you and you want to sleep with men, um, it's very difficult for that to happen if you don't conform to societal definitions of femininity, at least to some extent. Um, and that's this is we're talking about most men. We're not talking about all men, but we're talking about really a structure, right? We're talking about a structure that defines femininity in such a way and then links sexual attraction to it, right? Um, so, over here, we need to talk about gays and lesbians, and we have to talk about compulsive heterosexuality. Okay, Compulsive heterosexuality was a term coined by Adrian Rich, a feminist scholar, and it has to do with the way in which we not only associate biological sex with gender, but we associate it with sexuality. So there's this, this actual kind of idea that somehow having a particular, you know, organ like breasts, you know, or vagina somehow, you know, makes you be attracted to, uh, you know, a penis, right? So this is, you know, the way in which sex gets mapped onto gender, gets mapped onto sexuality, that if you have breasts, you're attracted to, um, you know, babies, right? Because you have the means to feed them, so then you're naturally going to want babies. If you have a vagina, you're going to have this attraction to penises, right? So that there's somehow an association between your gender and your sexual feelings, right? You're, which, And the way that's usually defined is in terms of heterosexuality. And so there's assumption of heterosexuality. There's an assumption that... Vaginas like penises. Penises like vaginas, right? That somehow these two fit together. That somehow by virtue of you having a vagina and being a woman, you're going to be a heterosexual woman who's attracted to men. And the same is true for men. If they have a penis, they're going to want a vagina, right? So there's this kind of compulsive heterosexual. So this is assumption of heterosexuality. But by compulsive heterosexuality, Rich is talking about then societal's compulsion, right, societal, societal, society compelling you to have heterosexual desire, right, it be, it's the norm, right, you're supposed to have heterosexual desire for the opposite sex, right, so why wouldn't you want to wear feminine clothing, of course you want to attract men, if men like that kind of clothing, you should wear it, right, and, of course, you want men to notice you because you're attracted to men, right? Because you have a vagina, right? So there's this assumption that we're all heterosexuals, but more than an assumption, there's also a compulsion by society um, that, you know, requires us to behave in heterosexual ways and to in engage in heterosexual behaviors, right? So then where does this leave everybody else, all of the gays and lesbians, Right? How does gender relate to sexuality for gays and lesbians? Right? Well, because we have this um, strong association in our society between gender and sexuality, and because we have this expectation of heterosexuality, um, people get very confused about gays and lesbians, right? Um, there's an assumption that if you are gay or lesbian, that... Um, then you're going to have a certain gender presentation, right? So if you're a gay male, right, if you're a man that has a penis but you're attracted to penises, then there's an expectation that you should behave like a woman, right? Because somehow feminine behavior and femininity is associated with attraction to penises, right? So we confuse gender with sexuality, and then we expect gay men to be feminine in order to be gay. We also then expect gay women or lesbians to be masculine. So that to be attracted to a vagina, again, is to act like a man or to be masculine. When in fact these are two different things, right? So you have people who are gay, right? You have a lot of men who are gay who actually have all of the masculine traits that society defines. And then you have women who are lesbian who have all of the feminine traits that society defines. 
And then you have people who are genderqueer who are not even uh, gay or lesbian or bisexual, right? So you have heterosexual women, for example, who challenge societal definitions of gender or who define themselves in some sort of third gender term or who are androgynous, right? So if I were a heterosexual woman dressed like this, um, you can say that I was genderqueer. But being genderqueer doesn't necessarily mean that I am a lesbian. So actually my gender presentation does not actually tell you about my sexual desire. And my sexual desire will not tell you about my gender presentation. So there are people who are genderqueer, who are either androgynous or who are male-bodied but have a female gender presentation. They have a male body but they wear female clothes or they have a female body but they wear male clothes or they have whatever body but they wear androgynous clothes. And those people are genderqueer. But they're not necessarily sexually queer. They're not necessarily attracted to the same gender in terms of sexual activity. right? But because we have this strong association between gender and sexuality and this expectation of compulsive heterosexuality, we tend to make these conflations, right? Why are these a problem, right? Apart from the fact that they're mistakes, right? So we get things wrong. Does that really matter? I look at you, you're dressed like a man, I assume you're a man, turns out I'm wrong. Or I look at you and you're a woman but you're dressed like a man so I assume you're a lesbian, it turns out I'm wrong. Does that really matter? Um, you have a vagina and then I expect you to wear a dress and to sleep with men, does that really matter, right? Well, it matters if it does any of these things. And so this is what we're always asking ourselves as feminists, right? When we're, when we're analyzing society and analyzing behavior, analyzing gender, we're always thinking about oppression, right? Because that's what feminism is about, addressing the oppression of women. It's about the liberation of women, it's about equality, and it's about, um, you know, removing obstacles from women's lives, right? Allowing women to have the same opportunities that men have, allowing women to be free from a lot of harms that are currently in their life, like violence, right? So, you have to ask, do these definitions of gender degrade? Do they belittle? Do they limit? Do they restrict? Do they disempower? Right? And, you know, you really have to think about it. That's why it's necessary to have feminist theory. You really have to analyze these things because they're not straightforward, right? So, is a dress, is wearing a dress inherently disempowering, right? Is wearing a headscarf inherently disempowering, right? Maybe it's not inherently disempowering, but maybe you have to look at its signification and its use in that particular society, right? So if a dress, if you, if you look instead for things that are limiting, you'll notice that although different cultures have different clothing expectations for women, that one thing that all of the clothing expectations have in common is that they usually involve clothing that is in some way limiting, right? And there are different ways to limit, or they're in some sense degrading or belittling or disempowering or restrictive, right? So we can look at something like a dress and see how, say, if you wanted to run, it's going to limit your ability. So a dress definitely will limit your ability to be physical, right? Um, if someone's chasing you and you have to run high heels will also limit your athletic ability, limit your ability to get away from somebody, right? To walk quickly or to run right? or to fight, okay? It puts you at a disadvantage, right? Um, being scantily clad, right, can also put you at a disadvantage. You often find women who are cold because they're wearing very few clothes in a very cold climate because that's considered feminine, sexually attractive attire. You often find women wearing tight clothing. Tight clothing is also limiting and restrictive. Again, you can't run in tight clothing. You don't have the same freedom of movement. Okay? Something like a headscarf may not be inherently restrictive, but if you're in a very hot climate where it's extremely hot out and you have to keep your head covered at all times, you're going to have an elevated body temperature, which is going to cause you to be um, more faint, right, and less 
capable of doing physical things. If you have to wear a lot of clothes, a complete burqa, several layers of clothing in a climate which is extremely hot and humid, you're not going to be able to be very physical. There are a lot of things you're not going to be able to do because you're going to be physically limited by the heat caused by the excessive clothing, right? So it's not necessarily that a certain kind of clothing is inherently um, oppressive, but you have to look at the function that that clothing plays in that particular society. And then you have to compare it to men's clothing, right? So um, there are a lot of aspects of women's clothing or women's attire, too, which mark them as either sexually available or unavailable, right? So like the misses versus the miss. We don't have anything for men like that. So we don't know a man's marital status. But we have to know a woman's marital status, whether or not she is available. And then that restricts her, right? It restricts her and defines her in ways beyond her. Um, same with clothing. You know, in a lot of societies where there are really restrictive clothing norms for women, you don't have any clothing norms for men. So, you know, a woman may be expected to wear a certain kind of dress or a certain kind of clothing, and a man can wear anything. A woman may be expected to cover a great deal of her body or certain parts of her body, whereas a man can be practically naked. Okay, so you have to look at these different clothing um, restrictions, these different clothing definitions in terms of restriction or limitation, or degrading. You know, um, do you know? Do we have a power suit for women? Right, we have power suits for men. We have clothing that men wear that vest them with a certain aura of authority. Do we have anything equivalent for women? You need to ask questions like this. And that's how you determine whether or not gender is oppressive.